Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. We've got some people joining us already. Welcome to our SOT update webinar. I'm joined tonight by Dr. Steph. Hi, Dr. Steph. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so we'll just kind of, we'll give people like a, just a minute or so to jump on. I see, oh, I see some very familiar faces, very familiar names on here. Hi, guys. Hi everyone, we've got Singapore in the house, we've got Australia in the house. Very cool. All right. So I'll give you a little bit of an outline just to kind of get a bit of an intro going here. The, the purpose of tonight is not to go through all the sort of ins and outs of what is SOT and how does it work and kind of what does it look like, all the logistics. We did do a webinar on that already. You can find that on YouTube under my channel um, if you have not heard that, just to get a little bit more of the background information of, you know, the, the what is it and how does it work, right? So, uh, and Dr. Steph is going to just give a, you know, one to two minute description of that just to kind of bring everyone to the same page. Uh, the purpose for our webinar tonight was that now we've been doing SOT for a few months, We've kind of, you know, we've learned a few things along the way. We want to just sort of validate and confirm some of the logistics, like how the period of time to be off antimicrobials before blood draw, before infusion, some of those kind of um, questions. But then also um, just to answer your questions. And I actually have a couple of emails that have come in to me from, um, from a couple of patients. So I'm going to make sure those questions get answered. Um, but feel free to ask questions also. Um, and we also have a, a fun case report to give you um, with a lab update. So you should be able to utilize the chat feature. Just make sure everyone is selected if you write something in the chat. Um, or we have the Q&A um, that you can post questions. So you can post in either one and we will try and get to those. So it's not gonna be a formal presentation. We don't have slides. I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Steph um just to kind of chat and give you a bit of an update and then we will get right to questions so dr steph welcome hi hi our resident sot ozone iv head of all the things i am so excited to give this sot update i've been like really into learning as much as i can about sot and um, having a lot of our patients get started on it. So it's been four months now since our first SOT infusion with some of our patients. So now at this webinar, it's fun to kind of have an update of like actually using it in practice and seeing some of the results that we're having. So um, I think it'll be fun to go through all of that. And I did want to just touch on, like you said, this isn't all about SOT. We did a webinar on that, like the basics of what it is, but I just wanted to briefly go over it for anybody who hasn't heard of heard that webinar yet. But basically SOT stands for supportive oligonucleotide therapy. And it's choosing for, we're doing it for Lyme and co-infections and some viral infections in our practice. So what SOT does is it takes a patient's blood and it creates a very specific nucleotide sequence targeted at one infection. And the goal of that SOT is to do an infusion for the patient and it goes systemically throughout the body and binds to that infection and it shuts it off basically so that it can't continue to survive and um, it inhibits replication of the bacteria basically. So you're stopping the infection and it's unique because there's nothing else that's patient specific like this. Like every single SOT dose is made for each individual based off of a blood draw that you do and get sent to the lab. So it's different than herbs, different than antibiotics. Um, it's really like amazing with the technology that they're using for it. So that's kind of an overview of just what SOT is. I really wanted to get started most importantly by showing you all a case study that we have with one of our patients who's done SOT. So I am going to share my screen actually really quickly so that I just wanted to be able to show you some data because I know it's always so interesting to see the labs and, and what's changed and actually be able to see some results and stuff from people. So let me share here. Okay, so you should be able to see that. 
And basically, so with this patient, this is a summary overview. I typically recommend that our patients use the vibrant tick-borne testing for SOT. So this patient had done an SO or excuse me, a tick-borne 1.0 panel back in June 2022. So that's what's on the left side. And that lab there is a is a summary of what came back positive. So you can see the IgG antibodies and the IgM antibodies that were positive for this patient before he did SOT. I put the red boxes around, around it there so you could kind of see which infections were the highest ones that he had. So there's quite a few that came back in the red range. And then based off of the symptoms here, so Picking a target is what gets a little tricky because SOT is so specific, you have to go for one infection at a time. And I think if you don't talk to the patient at all and you were just to see this lab report, it looks like, oh, IgM is positive for the Borrelia turricate, so that's the best target to go for. But when I actually met with this patient and did the SOT consult, um, a lot of his symptoms were really Bartonella-like, like the central nervous system symptoms and mood changes and um, some more like muscular pain and nerve pain. So we actually decided together that Bartonella was most likely causing like the current symptom picture for him compared to these other infections. And um, yeah, so we decided to go with Bartonella first as the target because of that. And and the other thing with SOT is once you treat one infection, it's common for some of the others to kind of take over and predominate and make their symptoms a little bit more intense and stronger as well. So my concern was that he was going to have more of a Bartonella flare if we went after like the Lyme or something else first. So we went with the Bartonella. So he had his first SOT infusion in December for Bartonella Vinsoni, that was the one target that we did. And he did a follow-up test. This is our only patient so far that's retested. Um, it's still a little early. I typically recommend people retest like four to six months after the infusion. However, he was having positive symptom improvement after the first in, uh, infusion and he wanted to do a second target and his labs were out of date at that point. You do have to have labs that are positive within a six month period to be able to order SOT. So he did need to update his testing to be able to even pick another target for SOT, which is why he retested after only three months of the first infusion. So the really cool thing though, is the change in results that we see already after that three month mark because SOT works for up to six months within the body. So sometimes you don't get the changes until later on. However, after only three months, he had a lot of big shifts. So you can see the right side there was his um, most recent lab results that were just from the end of February here. And a lot of infections totally cleared like that list there that's on the left. I, I wrote out for infections that were no longer positive. So um, a lot of them didn't show up at all, even on the testing as positive. And most importantly, the target that we had picked for Bartonella and Sony had completely gone into um, normal range. So that was super cool. The one thing that got a little bit more um, pronounced on his retest was that the Borrelia burgdorferi came back more positive. So it was both IgM and IgG positive the second time around. So that tells us that the next target, the most um, significant infection at this point is going to be the Borrelia burgdorferi, which we're planning to do for his number two SOT infusion. So I wanted to just break this down a little bit more so you could see the actual changes here. So again, this was the SOT target that he chose for his first infusion, Bartonella Vinsoni. We chose this based on his symptoms and based on this IgG test result. So this is a little confusing, but if you look at it, the right side of both the IgG and the IgM column where it says previous was from his first labs. The left side where it says current is his current results that we just retested. So previously he was 21.8 for the IgG in the red. And after three months of the SOT, he's really low on both antibodies for IgM and IgG. And most importantly, he's had a lot of symptom improvement. He's been writing me some updates and um, he seemed to have a lot of those symptoms that were causing like severe problems for him have let up a bit. Not to say he's totally symptom... Um, not symptomatic anymore. There's definitely still some things to work on. And as we saw the Borrelia burgdorferi got a little more positive. So we're going to keep going with SOT because he has had um, such a great response to this first infusion already, which is amazing. And then just to show up 
show you this Borrelia burgdorferi breakdown as well for him. So same thing, it's broken down into the IgG and the IgM categories of antibodies. The right side of those is the previous result from the first lab before SOT. The left side is the current result from his most recent labs after the three months of the Bartonella of Insoni. So um, before he was positive for the alternative Lyme criteria and his most current labs, he's positive for the IgG and the IgM on the alternative criteria. So this tells us that Bartonella, or excuse me, not Bartonella, Borrelia burgdorferi is a great next target for his second SOT. So that's super cool and exciting. And that was the big um, case that I wanted to share with you all. We haven't had any other patients so far that I've done infusions for do a retest yet on their labs. Um, the other thing that we've definitely seen is, is herxing and flaring. So that's um, what most patients have reported like symptom wise. And yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing here so that we can take it back to us. And I also wanted to just give you a few updates and takeaways. Like now we've been doing this for a few months. So there's definitely things that we've been learning along the way as we're incorporating it. But overall, I would say that, especially with those results um, in that first retest, like SOT is seeming really promising and we're having success with it for dropping down the infections. Um, and other than that, I do, I know, so one of the big concerns that a lot of patients had was safety. So the question is like, is this safe? It's kind of a newer therapy. We haven't been doing it for that long. And I feel confident that SOT is not, causing like side effects or other reactions like from the SOT molecule itself. I've done quite a few of these infusions at this point and I've not had one patient react badly to the actual infusion or have any significant concerns from the SOT itself. Uh, like I had mentioned before, kind of the biggest thing that's been happening for people is having those Herx and die-off reactions. So once you start to kill the infection, We've seen people having Herx reactions that are connected to that infection target. So like if we do SOT for Bartonella, you could have flare and Bartonella symptoms. We've also seen the opposite kind of thing happen where you target Bartonella and the Bartonella symptoms go down, but you have a flare of your Lyme symptoms. So then your joint pain's worse and all of those other things that we expect to see more connected to Lyme. Um, so Herxing really is the biggest side effect. It's hard to say like the degree of herxing because everybody's different and it's it's similar to if you're using, you know, antibiotics or herbs or whatever. I would say that you can, I think knowing your body and how you respond to things in the past can give you some insight into how you might have a herx reaction to this sort of thing. Of course, it's not always perfect, but um, I think it's important to have your tools ready to go because one of the best ways to prevent that herx reaction is to keep up with the die off and helping your body to get rid of that and excrete it. So having the tools you use for that, whether it's supplements or even home detox support, castor oil packs, you know, all the good stuff. So um, that is one big, big thing that I really recommend having in place when you're going to start doing your SOT infusions to help with potential die off. Um, second thing is that I do, I've been finding, so I was, I was unsure if it was going to be best to start with one SOT and then kind of like see how that went for a while before adding in a second one. However, I really do feel like at this point with the patients that we've had done, it's almost everyone has had like a, a secondary flare after doing their first infusion from another type of co-infection or Lyme or whatever it is. So I do think that if you're going to go with SOT, it's really worth it to be invested in doing at least two to four different SOT targets for the like your first round because usually there's more than one infection and you're you're gonna have other things that start to pop up positive or change just like we saw with those results from the patient that um some things can can go down some things can go up so it's likely that something else is going to pop up as you drop one down and you'll likely need to do another um, targeted treatment for that so i do think that the best results will be seen if you really are committed to doing more than one sot if you get started on that path we have actually most of the patients that we're doing them on have done sot for so far are probably getting ready to do their second or third at this point so um, that's kind of what we've been seeing so far and then the other thing I wanted to bring up, because I'm sure people might have questions about this too, but there is, 
some controversy around biofilm with SOT. So biofilm, as a lot of you probably know, is a protection mechanism that's secreted by these infections. So they create a literal sticky goo that they cover themselves in, and this makes treatment a lot harder. So whether you're using herbs or antibiotics, sometimes those treatments don't get through to the infection because they're protected by this biofilm layer. So the question with SOT is, does it get through biofilm? Is biofilm a concern that we also need to worry about when using SOT? There's two thoughts to it. So I have been recommending biofilm agents just because I don't think it hurts to add them in and to have um, some more help with breaking down biofilm. However, there's another thought that I've heard other doctors talk about with SOT where Biofilm is technically secreted by the bugs, so it should have the same DNA. And if that's part of the, the um, SOT is targeting DNA, then it should still recognize that biofilm as part of the SOT target, which I, I see that point. I think it can get more complicated because who knows? I mean, this is very unknown territory, of course. So who really knows if the biofilm is from multiple bugs, if you need to be working on it, aside from just that one target infection, because there's usually more than one infection. So, so far I've been recommending biofilm agents with SOT. So we'll see how, if that's been helpful and um, if that is changing results at all, once we start getting some labs back. But those are the major updates that I have overall. I really, I'm so excited about it. And um, we've had quite a few patients get started with it at this point, and we're seeing um, definitely Herx reactions from it, which is, you know, a good thing in that it's killing the infection as long as you're keeping up with the detox and supporting your body as you're killing things off. And then those positive lab changes that we've gotten from one patient so far that's done the retesting. So I'm so excited to be bringing this to Restore, and I think it's a great great option to add in with other treatments because again you don't need to be doing SOT by itself it's definitely something that can be combined with even antibiotics and herbs and other things so it's another tool in our toolbox and chronic Lyme gets really complicated so it's a great thing to be able to add on board um, and I know there's also confusion sometimes with um, taking antimicrobials and doing SOT so I just wanted to give another update I think our last webinar might have actually been a little bit outdated because RGCC, the lab who does the SOT creation, um, had made an update, I think, right after we did our webinar. So now the recommendation as of right now is that you stop antimicrobial therapies, and that includes herbs and antibiotics or prescriptions, two weeks before the blood draw that you send your SOT to the lab, and also two weeks before you get the actual infusion. And then you need to also stay off your antimicrobials for one week after the infusion. The reason for staying off of those things before the blood draw is that it helps the lab be able to better isolate the DNA of the infection so you're not killing it off. Um, they can find it better and then make you an SOT for that. The second reason why you want to be off of it before two weeks before your infusion and one week after your infusion is so that you can allow the SOT to find its target better without any sort of disturbance or interference because when you start to add those antimicrobials in um, it can somewhat distract potentially is the thought so um, just keeping them out for a week so that you can allow everything to kind of get to where it needs to go and then you can totally add things back in after that. It is okay to stay on other supportive supplements during that time. So that only applies to antimicrobial things like um, antibiotics and herbs that are killing the actual infections. It's okay to be staying on your supportive things like any detox support, herbs, liver support, er herbs, glutathione, um, binders, all of that's totally fine. It's really just the antimicrobials. So Dr. Seth, what about doing that. ozone therapy? Yeah. Um, ozone's fine after that period as well, because ozone can also be potentially antimicrobial itself. So you want to stop ozone before the two weeks and one week after also, but you can definitely get back on it after that period of time. Super. So yeah, I think I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Nicola. I think we're going to open it up for Q&A yes. and answer some questions that have Yeah, come and the other thing that um, that you were saying to me the other day, Dr. Steph, so I mean, we've been doing this for a few months and obviously SOTs can work for up to six months. And so, you know, it's not like we have tons of patients who've been in this for a couple of years, but we do have some patients that 
have transferred their SOT therapy to us. Mm, yeah. You have been doing it longer. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Great point. I forgot about that. So we do have a couple patients who were doing SOT at a different clinic and they're local to San Diego. And I don't think there's anywhere else in San Diego doing SOT right now. So they moved to our clinic just because it's local for them. So those two patients, I think, I believe they've each done around five or so SOT in the last year or two. And both of them have had changes in their labs as well. So they've gone from positives to negatives and in control with the antibodies, um, plus had symptom improvement. So both of those patients have switched over and are now using their SOT kind of like maintenance. Like they're they're picking a few infections every year to just test and target and, and keep on SOT to keep clearing its symptoms for them and to kind of keep infections in control. Because I think the other important thing to know is that, I mean, with any Lyme treatment, like we don't ever really say that you're cured from Lyme, right? It's more like a remission kind of situation. So it's chronic infections can potentially reactivate even if they've been in check. So SOT is not something that's going to like totally clear your infection forever. It's not a vaccine. Like your immune system doesn't recognize it. So you're not creating like a forever memory to this infection. It's for that six month period of time of stopping replication. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point. And I mean, this is sort of what I was, we were talking about this earlier that, you know, there are therapies that have really, really positive, like that, that do really well mm-hmm. and that help a lot of people, but there's no one thing, like there's no magic bullet. And I so wish there was yeah. in chronic Lyme, but there isn't. And so we're not, you know, we're just trying to be very realistic about like, this looks really promising. We were seeing people have positive results. We're seeing positive changes on labs. Um, we're seeing people herxing, which is telling us that, you know, things are being killed. Mm-hmm. We're seeing a very, very, very low side of, or zero side effects of the actual SOT itself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and at the same time, it's, it's one more promising, more, more hopeful modality, but it's not a guarantee that it's going to like wipe Lyme out for everybody. You know, there's, there's just no thing that does that sadly. Totally. Um, yeah. So, you know, we just kind of take the balanced approach and, and, move forward very optimistic about how this is going for people um and just the technology and the science i mean it's really incredible like it's really really incredible and i think you know i've been in the line world for 20 years actually this this september will be 20 years in practice for me wow yeah yeah 18 years of restore medicine so um you know, a, a patient's asking me every, what's new in line treatment? What's new in line treatment? I go to the eyelids conference. What's new? What's new? What's new? And I'm like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we talked about methylation. I mean, you know, like there's not been anything really exciting for a while. Yeah. There's been new antibiotic protocols, Dapsone and Disulfiram and yeah. other things that, you know, have a much, much higher side effect profile. So, so this is kind of exciting. Totally. Uh, so yeah. let's look at questions. There's a couple in the Q&A, and then I've also got a couple by email. So let's go to the Q&A first. Cindy said, it's been my understanding that once Lyme or co-infections are chronic and no longer acute, one will no longer test positive. Without a positive test, how will the therapy be ordered? So I'm going to, Dr. Steph, if it's okay, I'm going to address the, the general yeah. part of that, and then you can talk about the SOT part. Yeah, definitely. So... Um, Cindy, it's, it's not actually correct. It's not always correct that once infections are chronic, they won't test positive. So what we do see, and, and I have found that with chronic Lyme, I see both IgG and IgM positive. It's not necessarily following the textbook definition of IgM is at the very beginning of the infection and then IgM goes away and then IgG comes in and then you get treated and IgG goes away. It doesn't quite work like that. So with chronic Lyme, you can get an antibody response many years later, um, even when they're chronic. And even when people are in remission, sometimes we still get an IgG response because they do have memory cells. Like it may be that the infection is is not affecting them, but there still may be an IgG antibody response. Um, So there, there is the potential for having a positive test when one is chronic and not acute, because really it's the chronic people with Lyme that we're doing this with. It's not acute Lyme. Acute Lyme, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't see that much of it in San Diego, but definitely our population is the chronically unwell. 
And these people, some of these people have been sick 15, 20 years. So they're still getting positive lab responses. Um, so yes, and Lyme is inherently immune suppressive. So that's, we do use the Vibrant. I always sing the praises of Igenix and I love Igenix. But why we like Vibrant for SOT is because of the specificity of the strains they test for. They test for a lot of different strains. And since SOT is like strain specific, if you will, um, that becomes important. So Dr. Steph, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I wanted to also touch on, yes, agree. I see people with chronic Lyme with in co-infections with both IgM and IgG positive all the time. Um, it doesn't, these chronic infections definitely don't follow like the classical rules of infection. They're totally a different like ball game, but um, I think your point is also interesting with what you mentioned where IgG can stay elevated even after people clear the infection. And that's true. And I've also seen that in patients who have, have no longer have any symptoms, but they were still having some positive test results. And I think at that point, like the most important piece of all of this is, is the patient feeling better, right? Like we're trying to help people not have these symptoms anymore and not have to deal with this um, every day. So I think that symptom improvement is always the number one thing and that it is going to be likely that some people might stay positive for the IgG. However, symptom improvement is always number one, I think. And, and the labs are helpful and they're very useful tools, um, but monitoring the response is always like the most important thing. A hundred percent. I totally agree. And I will also add that 98% of my patients are positive IgG for Epstein-Barr mm -hmm. or yeah. CMV or HHV6 or whatever, name the virus. Yeah. So they're all like, oh my gosh, my I've got Epstein-Barr. It's really bad Epstein-Barr. But it's IgG positive. But in my experience, um, the, the, the virus is a secondary to the bacteria. Like the viruses aren't actually causing a lot of the symptoms. And part of the reason I can say that is because I've had people come to me who've been on Valtrex and Valcite and all these different antivirals for two years with their supposed EBV diagnosis and not got any better. And then we just, then we find it's actually Lyme and co-infection start treatment and, and things start shifting. So you can have an IgG response. And I can actually tell you, I was doing thyroid labs. By the grace of God, I don't have Lyme. I'm very healthy, thankfully. I was just doing thyroid labs. And I was like, you know what? I'm For curiosity's sake, I'm going to do Epstein-Barr, uh, mycoplasma pneumonia, like all these things I see everyone IgG positive for. And I'm like, well, is that because they have Lyme? Sure enough, mine were as well. Hmm. So I think, you know, if we've been exposed to something, we can have IgG responses to it. But to Dr. Steph's point, the important thing is the clinical presentation. Like if somebody is really symptomatic with Bartonella symptoms or Borrelia symptoms, then that, that guides, then we put the labs in context with the clinical picture. And we've always done that with Lyme, like Lyme's a clinical diagnosis backed up with, with lab work. And we've always done that. Um, so yeah, so Cindy, I hope that answers your question. That was a long answer to your question, but okay. So Jason is like, is asking how do you administer it exactly? Um, he's seen different doctors do it a little different way. So I'm talking, I'm thinking, Jason, you're talking about the actual infusion process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a pretty simple infusion. Basically, the SOT gets shipped back to us. I should have had one here, but they're they're in like these little tubes, and they're basically like you have to actually use a magnifying glass to like see it. It looks like this empty little tube, but they're in there and they're these super tiny little um, molecules. So what I do is I turn that back into a liquid. So we add some sterile water to that and mix it up so that you get all those um, crystals dissolved into the liquid. From there, you draw the SOT up with some saline into a syringe. So it's administered as a, as a push. Now, before you do the SOT push, so we hook you up to an IV, just a regular saline drip, like nothing fancy. And before the actual SOT, I do use a steroid. So we've been using the recommended protocol by RGCC. It's dexamethasone, uh, four milligrams, very low dose of a steroid. It is recommended by the lab that you use the steroid before the infusion, two reasons. The first reason being that it helps to close the the vein walls a little bit. So SOT is so small that it can easily get kind of like lost. So, you know, so you have the IV that's in your arm here and you infuse it, 
you don't want the molecules to kind of just disperse into this area. You want to keep them in your bloodstream so that they're actually getting systemic and going to all these different locations. So the steroid is recommended by the lab to make the SOT more effective at getting throughout the whole body. So it helps with closing up the vein wall so it doesn't get lost. Number two, it is supposed to help with any theoretical reactions to the SOT. There have never been any reported allergic reactions of SOT, like zero allergic reactions that have been reported. So I don't think it's a huge concern. I think it's more about um, making it as effective as possible and not getting any of those SOT molecules lost. So the steroids administered and then give that about like five minutes or so. And then the actual SOT push is pushed through the IV line and it takes about like, I don't know, maybe five to 10 minutes to push the actual SOT through. And then you just drip the rest of the saline to help it disperse throughout the body for another 10 minutes or so. And that's it. So the whole procedure is probably around 30 minutes start to finish once you get hooked up um, and go. Other than the ceremony, right? I mean, we've had people come in in, in funeral gowns. We've had, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we There is some ceremony around like saying goodbye to this pathogen and saying goodbye to that infection. Like, there is. It's kind of a funeral sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Um, Katie had a question from Patrick. How do you know that patients are herxing and not flaring from the SOT? Yeah, good question. I'm assuming, well, okay, I'm a little confused about, do you mean flaring like a secondary infection is how I'm taking this? So like a herx would be more of like your typical symptoms that are connected to that infection. So we think that get worse. So if you do the Bartonella SOT and you believe that you've connected Bartonella symptoms to like pain in the soles of the feet and anxiety and panic attacks, let's say, and those symptoms get a lot worse, then that's usually a Herx. That's a die-off reaction from the Bartonella dying and releasing its contents. And then your symptoms get worse. Flaring I take that as like a flare of other infections. I don't know if this is what you mean, Patrick, but um, so we've had patients who do like the, the Bartonella SOT infusion and they don't really have BART symptoms. Instead, they get a flare of like joint pain and other symptoms. And to me, that's a flare of like a different infection. So that's how I'm differentiating it. If you have another follow-up question, just type it in and I'll, I'll answer that better. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So hang on. Katie's got. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So Patrick thinks it's a great or... question. Yeah. <laughs> Either just secondary or just the original targeted pathogen. So I think, I think, Katie and Patrick, the original targeted pathogen is the hooks, right? Your familiar symptoms for that pathogen that, that are exacerbated. Yeah. Whereas a flare could be, as Dr. Steph said, a different pathogen, or some people just like flare with the full moon or just have waxes mm -hmm. and wanes of their symptoms. And that's not always easy to pinpoint, but that's true of any therapy. Like, Yeah. Also, I just thought of, cause you mentioned this briefly too, but like, I think that it's also possible to have flares of other conditions that are not infections. So if you're also dealing with mold illness and you've been living in a moldy home and, and you're having other symptoms get worse, it could be that you're now needing to deal more with like mold treatment versus actually going after SOT and infections. And there's a long list of other things that can be connected to sick symptoms secondary to infections. Um, but another thing to consider, like it's not always just the infection. I think it it's easy to get focused on like, it's the Lyme, it's the Lyme, like we got to kill the infection. But sometimes um, the best, I think, improvement can come from actually doing some of the other things, like the repair from the Lyme, you know, or the other mold issues. So just keeping in mind that it's not always only infections too. Yeah. And so Katie's follow-up question for clarification, do you ever see a flare of the original targeted pathogen? I think what we're saying is we see herxing of the original targeted pathogen. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Um, all right. So then Emily had a question. How long does it take to get back the SOT from the lab in Europe? Yeah, good question. Recently, it's been about three weeks or so for us. So you do need to do the blood draw to send to the lab. Once it gets sent, it's been about three weeks total for turnaround for it to end up back in our office ready for infusion. And then how long, once it gets back to us, what's the window that people have to infuse? 
six months. So once we get it, you have six months to use it. So it's not any sort of rush. Like you got to get in and do it as soon as possible, but um, you do have up to six months and some people are ordering more than one SOT just to go after their top three infections, just to get going right away. So you can order all three at one time and then space them out in that six month period if you want to, like however you want to do it. So we definitely have people doing that too. Well, and um, that's nice then to avoid the six month lab. Exactly. The six month um, valid lab results too. Totally. Yeah. Cause it gets tricky a little bit with the timing with like, well, you got to have the positive lab and you want to do it's basically six months is like the big rule, like six months for labs, six months, once we get the actual SOT. So that's kind of the timing that you get to space it out. And I will say, so what we've been doing so far, which seems to be working pretty well is we sent the blood gets sent to the lab. The lab emails me once they're shipping the SOT. So Usually when we get that shipping notification from them, we are notifying the patients and letting them know, hey, your SOT is expected to be in in about two weeks and you're, you can stop your antimicrobials at that point because it is recommended to be off those antimicrobials for two weeks. So we let you know once it's been shipped to us and then you can kind of schedule there from however out you want to be but a minimum of two weeks so that you can be off all your things. So that's kind of the way we've been having it flow and it's been working really well to do it that way. Great. That's perfect. Um, Brad's asking, how many SOTs would a patient typically need to treat EBV? To treat EBV, you know, it's dependent on every person and every infection. Like, as we saw in that case study, some, like some people clear that one infection and others with just one SOT in three months, other people, I do have some of those patients who were doing SOTs at other clinics and are now switching over to our clinic. Um, they're repeating like a second Borrelia burgdorferi or whatever, because those numbers popped back up again. Um, so it's dependent person to person. I would say on average one to three, if I had okay, to give it a number. You. Um, Peter in Australia. Hi, nice to see you, Peter. Um, so a couple of questions here. Well, one is what testing proof do you need to get the specific infection to treat with testing so poor, especially in Australia? How can you really target each pathogen accurately? So Dr. Steph, do you want to just touch on the vibrant piece for that? Yeah. So do you know, can, can people in Australia use vibrant? Yes, they can. Oh, yes. well, that's great, actually. They can. And Peter's also asking, can people in Australia arrange to get this treatment? Mm -hmm. So, Peter, just because I know a little bit more about the Australia piece. So we use a lab called Vibrant Labs to do testing for SOT because they're very specific to the, the pathogen and the strain of the pathogen. And you can get that testing done from Australia. I have, I've checked that. So you could get the testing done potentially if you found someone to do a blood draw and send it off to IGCC, because there's nothing special about the blood draw. It's a blood draw, send the blood off. That's all there is to it. Yep. You would then though need to be somewhere where they offer the SOT to get the infusion done. So I don't know of anywhere in Australia where they're doing that. Um, but you could get the testing done from there. I just don't know if anyone's offering SOT in Australia. And Peter, I would invite you, if you haven't seen our first webinar that talks more about the testing and the strains and how we pick targets, um, go to my YouTube channel. It's on Nicola Ducharme ND, and you'll find that webinar there. Um, and you might want to have a listen to that just to get some of the background information. Um, yes, we can. I'm just waiting on. Oh, Peter, you got vibrant. Okay, so you're 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 on the way. You're on the way. Okay, so. Oh, Greg's asking, can you do more than one SOT vial at the same time? You cannot. So each infusion needs to be spaced a minimum of three weeks apart. Um, that's what the lab is protocol is. I honestly, I think it's probably because one, you kind of want to give one target to do its thing and, and find that infection before you're adding in others. Um, two, the other thing with SOT, just to keep in, in the back of your mind is that it's it's one of those things like you're infusing it and it's going to go and it's going to kill stuff and you're not going to be able to change the dosing or stop it like it's it's in and you can't take it out once you've done the infusion 
and not to say that in a scary way, but just so that you realize like you can't adjust dosing like you can with other things. So the reason for that spacing is to also give you a chance to kind of see how your body's responding to the SOT before you start stacking on others. Because say you do your first one and you have like a big Herx reaction, maybe you need some more time and it's better for you to actually wait another two months before you add in a second target. So um, three weeks is the minimum between spacing them out and then again, once you order one, you have six months to use it. So it's really any time in between that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's like, I mean, we wouldn't start three antibiotics right on the same day. So, you know, why would you do three infusions kind of back, like lumped onto each other? All right, so that's all I see in the Q&A box. I'm going to jump over to my emails to those couple that came in earlier, and then I'll come back to the Q&A. So if you have anything else, we'll get back to it. Um, let me see. So I had a question from Graham and hopefully, um, so his son's been incapacitated for five years, positive Lyme, Guarini, Bart Bartonella, Hensley, but also screening for autoimmune brain disorders is strongly suggestive of chronic infectious disorder and post-infectious autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. So they're looking to pursue treatment, looking at SOT. So the question is, and Dr. Steph, I can start answering this and then you can chime in if you have anything else. However, when Lyme with co-infections co and autoimmune brain disorders are both present, what is your recommended treatment sequence, i.e. what should be addressed first? So this is like, that's a, you know, it's a complicated area, but I can share my experience is that the neuro and the neuro autoimmunity um, can be triggered by the infections. So you need to look at immune modulation, but you also need to deal with the infections. Um, so my view is however you deal with the infections, whether that's herbal antimicrobials, antibiotics, I feel like SOT could be a valid part of that plan. That has to happen as well. So there's a psychiatrist, psychiatrist neurologist, Lyme literate, psychiatrist neurologist here in San Diego that that I've co-managed quite a few patients with and she's she's very good at channeling people into IVIG and things to help with like autoimmune encephalitis and, and things of that nature but she sends people to me to deal with the infection part because if the autoimmunity is triggered by chronic infection which it could well be you can do IVIG or whatever till the cows come home but you need to still deal with the active infection so however that be done, so my opinion, and Dr. Steph, you can chime in too, is you could do SOT concurrently or maybe start with some of the treating the infection and knocking the infection load down because that may well filter through to lowering the autoimmune response. And if there's healing that needs to be done on more of an autoimmune level with low-dose naltrexone, IVIG, you know, the anti-inflammatories, all of that, that can be done. I would almost say the priority should be getting to the infection first, because while the infection is present, the autoimmunity is likely to continue. I totally agree with that view too. Okay. And I think the same way, like, because with autoimmune diseases, the question is like, well, why did your immune system start attacking things in the first place? Like there was some sort of trigger autoimmune diseases don't come out of like for no reason. Sure. There's some genetic susceptibilities that make you more likely to develop it. But for the most part, there's something that you've been exposed to or have infections or whatever that's connected to that. So I agree with going after some of the like root causes of the autoimmune disease in conjunction with, but, um, definitely making sure that's high on the priority list for autoimmune, any autoimmune condition. Okay. Super. We're on the same page. Okay. So then Vanessa, um, so mostly interested in effectiveness. I think we've talked about that. Does, does it keep working long-term if using every four months as they recommend? Well, I think we're clear that the SOTs can work for up to six months. That's the, that's the established time frame, right, Dr. Steph? Yep, up to six months. Okay. And then From the infusion time. Because um, I've also had some people ask, like, well, if the in SOT comes back to your clinic, but I don't do it for three months, is it only effective for three months after the infusion? And the answer to that is no. It's just, it's six months of efficacy from the moment that you do the infusion. So it doesn't matter how long you wait 
during that um, period to actually get it done. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So other questions here. So when the tests come back and results come back, say present Bartonella and Borrelia may be virus, who decides the order of treatment and do viruses need to be treated before the Lyme? Secondary question, don't just load it all on you, Dr. Steph. And if you've had the mold component, how does that complicate the settling down of all the symptoms? Yeah, good questions. Um, so typically, so I offer SOT consults. So if you, I think the best way to come prepared to an SOT consult is to have recent labs. If you don't, that's okay. We can still meet. However, having that lab work to talk to you and compare symptoms and labs together is really helpful. Um, so we can put it all together, but I help with ordering the layer of like, which SOT target are we going to choose first? Of course, if you work with Dr. Nicola and see Dr. Nicola, we can definitely chat together and come up with a plan um, based on what she's been treating for and all that kind of stuff too. Um, was there a secondary question after? Uh, yeah. What about the mold complication? Oh, the mold. Yeah. That's a big one that I'm still trying to navigate like is I still think it's worth I think you have to just be doing both as much as you mm -hmm. can and I know that it gets tricky and it's like there's some people who say well you have to treat the mold or the lime's not going to get better you have to treat the lime and the mold's not going to get better it's like a chicken and an egg sort of um thing so I think it's important to have both treatments on board as much as you can and you can do them in conjunction with each other. So again, like SOT isn't something that you need to choose over other treatments, whether that's for Lyme or mold. It's something that you can use in conjunction with these things so that you're able to target all of it together. And it makes it easy because it's not another thing to be taking every day. And like, you know, I know that I know with Lyme, it gets so easy to add on all these things in the binders and then the, this has to be separate and whatever. So SOT can make it easier because you're not needing to dose it every day you get the one infusion and it's working for six months so it does simplify things in in that sense like it's not another um med or supplement that you have to add to your schedule yeah well and i'm on the same page as you dr steph like the lime mold chicken egg rabbit hole it's like yeah and i know there are practitioners that are really so fixated on it being one way or the other and start here and start there but i mean if you i've come to the conclusion like i talked to a patient today and they were like well, I, I was working with another practitioner and we were just opening up detox pathways for two years because she didn't think I was ready to do any antimicrobial therapy. Mm. But two years later, she's no further along. And it's like, there comes a point where you have to just be like, just, we just have to do it to the best of our ability. Totally. And if the infections are like putting so much stress on the body that, that nothing else can work, then you've just got to get to the infection. So in my protocols, generally speaking, not speaking about SOT, but just in general, I try and chip away at the infections and the mold at the same time. And there are things in common, like the binders, the glutathione, the detox helpers. I mean, there's things that help with both things. But um, if you try to fix one thing and become perfect in that one thing before getting to the next thing, that may never happen. Yeah. And quite honestly, I mean, like people that are so fixated on like, oh, it's mold first, you have to do mold first and then that, like, that's not, how do you even know that that's true for every patient? Like that's not even an individualized approach at that point, because I think it can be both ways. Like some people, Lyme really is a big problem for them and that infection. And then other people like the mold really is what's causing a lot of the issues and you never know until you start treating them. So if you're so rigid about the order of things, then you end up like that. Like you're doing drainage for two years and not making any progress. So um, it's just doing as much as you can to kind of hit at everything and, and rotating through and, and adjusting as you go. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Okay, so a couple of questions back in the Q and A. I think we've just got a couple more questions. We did promise to be out of here um, by six, so we've got ten more minutes. Um, okay, Adrian saying if it's not clear which infection is causing the majority of the patient's symptoms. Would you choose to do an SOT for what is coming back most highly positive first? Yeah, good question, Adrian. So I know it it also gets tricky. Like some people don't know like what's causing their there's some certain patients who really 
have the sense that this infection is this, they've been treating for a while. So they kind of have an idea of how they've responded to other therapies and that that might be that, that infection. That's not always the case. Like sometimes it is difficult to differentiate. And is it like, is it neuro Lyme or is it Bartonella? It's, it's really hard to know sometimes and differentiate because of course there's a lot of overlap with all the symptoms as well. So if that were the case, I would use the labs definitely um, for choosing SOT. So Again, like we mentioned before, the antibodies don't always follow the rules. However, if you have an IgM that's high positive and you can't connect your symptoms to infections very well, I would probably recommend that you go for one of those high IgM infections just because IgM is typically more of an active, and again, like take that with a grain of salt because you can definitely have no IgMs positive and still have active infection issues with high IgGs, but um, the doctor that I trained with, with RGCC for SOT as well, um, her ordering kind of goes that way too. Like, of course, always compare with the patient's symptoms. However, if you're having difficulty with where to begin, you can always kind of go for those high IgMs first and then go over to the IgGs. So that's kind of general. Oh, I think you're muted. We can't hear you. Dr. Nicola, I think you're on mute. Are you on mute? Sorry, I muted myself. There I you are. I was like, <laughs> just just saying myself over here. Don't mind me. Oh my God, sorry. I was trying to mute so there was no background noise, but then, yeah. Um, so Christine's question is, have you ever used SOT in people, either children or adults, with PANS, autoimmune encephalitis? Any differences with how they respond? I have not. We haven't had any patients with that condition who have done SOT so far. Um, so I'm not sure about yeah. if there's a difference with the response. The one thing, so this is the one like potential symptom that I think can cause some complications with SOT where there have been some people who have not responded well to SOT is that if you have a history of seizures and that's like something that you experience, SOT might not be a great therapy for you just because seizures can be more one of the more dangerous Herx side effects. So if you were to develop like a severe seizure, that's um, definitely a lot more risky than some of the other symptoms, you know, like feeling brain foggy or whatever, like it's not great, but a seizure is definitely more serious than some of the other Herx symptoms. So I will say if, if seizures are a symptom that you have, that I would be a little bit hesitant with doing SOT again, because you can't change the dosing. So if you're killing infection more than you can handle and you're having a bunch of seizures, it's likely not going to be a safe option for you to go with SOT. Yeah. So Christy and I would just add to that, that, um, I, I would just look at it from a, a general Herx standpoint that so if somebody has encephalitis or PANS and those sort of neuro, if they're neuropsychiatric or whatever symptoms they're exhibiting, then you may see an exacerbation of that. And that would be part of the Herx response. So we don't have direct experience with that and we haven't done SOT. Actually, that's a good question, Dr. Steph. Is there any guidelines about SOT with children? Um, kids? Are, can definitely get SOT. There was an age, oh, I don't have it with me, but I want to say it's like five years old and older um, is fine. So kids that are older than, mm -hmm. don't quote me on that, but I, I think it's five years old, um, are able to get SOT. So there's no issue with administering SOT for kids at all. <laughs> Well, and, and because what I love about it is it's made for the individual, right? So you could give right. somebody's SOT remedy to someone else and it would do nothing. Yeah. You know, totally. so it's not like we're putting adult doses of some foreign substance into a child. It's like made from their blood. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I think, why there's not really these side effects or reactions. And it, it really right. doesn't, like, it doesn't interact with other meds. Like there's so much that you have to be careful of when you're balancing antibiotics or herbs. And does this have an interaction? Are they safe to take together? SOT doesn't have that concern. Like the only thing is, is stopping the antimicrobials to help with the efficacy of the SOT and finding its target. Right. But it's not a concern of, of like, you're going to cause interaction problems and side right. effects from combining meds and things like that. Right. Definitely. Um, can SOT be made for strep infection? It can't. And I don't know why, because 
I think that'd be a great target. I know that's like a huge issue with the the pans and pandas stuff too is is a lot of the um, strep, but right now there's not SOT that's currently available for strep. Oh, too bad. I know. Uh, maybe that'll change. Maybe they'll develop that. You know, they do, like if patients um, reach out and, and request things, like they're pretty good about adding infections and even different strains of Lyme and stuff. So if there's like an infection that you're really struggling with and you don't see that it's an available SOT target, um, they're pretty receptive and open to like requests for other uh, infections to start to develop that. So who knows? And you do SOT that. for candida? No, you can't. No. No it's a shame that. that they, well, and maybe in the future, but it would also be wonderful if they could develop some kind of SOT therapy. I know it's not a pathogen per se, but for like mycotoxins. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. I know it's not, it's not the same, but I wonder, you know, anyway. Yeah. We can, we can hope. <laughs> um, so probably the last question before we wrap up, do, oh, two, two questions. Okay. Um, do you ever see people that have had viral meningitis before more likely to get Lyme? Mm. So that's more of a general question, not really an SOT question. I don't even know if I have the answer for that. I have not seen that correlation. Have you seen anything on that, Dr. Steph? No. Vanessa, I don't, I, I've not seen that as like a connection. Um, oh, Peter has an interesting question. Could the future see SOT being used for long COVID if they can test still people have active infection? You know, I was curious if they're going to start developing like a COVID SOT. I don't see why they couldn't because they have other viral infections. Um, I don't know if it's you know, more of like a political thing not to get involved with the whole COVID stuff, or um, I'm not sure if they have one that they're working on. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know the status, but I could see that it would be useful. Um, long COVID is a whole another <laughs> can of worms. Long COVID is a whole other conversation, I but I also, cool. like, I see, oh my gosh, it's a whole other conversation. But yeah. anyway, I see, I mean, I think some long COVID is Lyme. And I see a lot of like people who come through COVID and frankly, just flus and stuff recently having Lyme flares from it. Yeah. So but anyway, that's another whole conversation. We won't get into that. Oh, I see. There's one more question if we want to just okay. end did on this. What from, did I miss? It's from Brad. It's in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. Do you see it? Um, do you want me to read it? Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Okay. So this one's from Brad. Would you treat a patient with CFS? chronic fatigue syndrome with just mm -hmm. high IgG to EBV and not IgM. And yes, so you can treat SOT in the lab does consider like even just a high IgG antibody as a positive to be able to order the SOT. Cause again, the lab does require that you have a positive um, result to be able to have SOT made. I think another important piece with which Dr. Nicola kind of mentioned earlier, Brad, is that what else is going on besides the EBV too? So usually chronic fatigue syndrome is, it doesn't tell us much. It doesn't tell us why are you having that? It's a symptom really. It's not getting to the root cause of what's causing your chronic fatigue. And yes, EBV can be involved in that. Uh, a lot of people are getting diagnosed with like the reactivated Epstein-Barr virus and connected to fatigue. And I do think that it can have a role in some of those symptoms for sure. But like Dr. Nicola mentioned, I also view EBV as very opportunistic. So it's one of those things like we've all been for the most part, like have been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus. If you test most people, they will have an IgG positive. And again, it high, high IgG is different because that's more uh, reactivation sometimes, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. Like there's a bigger question of if there's other infections. And that brings me to another point with um, SOT treatment. I actually, with most patients and all the patients that I've done SOT for so far, um, I recommend that you go for Lyme and co-infections before you go for, for any of the viral SOTs because uh, Dr. Nicola mentioned this earlier, like Borrelia burgdorferi can be so immune suppressive itself that sometimes when you take that out, your body can actually function better and even get rid of some of those um, chronic viral issues that have popped up as like an opportunistic thing. So most of the patients that I've been seeing um, 
we are running the Tickborne 1.0 panel just alone without the other viral piece because to me, if they're positive in those Lyme and co-infections, I'm not even going to treat the viral stuff until we've gone for some of those other Lyme things. So that's been my approach. And so far it's been, I think, um, working to keep doing it that way. So, you know, if you, if you go for all those, uh, bacterial infections and the Lyme and co-infections and you're still having viral things positive, then sure, I think it's useful to go for some of those too and, and do SOT. I have had one of my patients who transferred to us who's done um, the Epstein-Barr SOT. So I think they're useful. However, it's a piece of just a piece of the puzzle. And basically that was a huge tangent from your question, but <laughs> yes, you can, t- you can do uh, SOT for only a high IgG for EBV. Well, but I think your I think your answer was was valuable, Dr. Steph, because if if there was absolutely no trace of tick-borne infection, absolutely negative for everything Lyme related, and Epstein Barr was really the standout and it was crazy high IgG, then yes, fine. Yeah. Or if it was IgM positive, then maybe yes, fine. Yeah. Um for sure. But yeah, I agree with you, Dr. Steph, that the EBV would be considered secondary. And yeah. more opportunistic to the tick-borne infections. I don't think I've ever worked with anybody who had EBV positive without other things being off right. too. Whether right. that was also not infection related, you know, like mold or environmental chemicals or some nervous system dysregulate, like you name like a million things that could contribute to allowing viruses to reactivate. But well, um, so I have a patient right now who's being treated for. Borrelia and Bartonella. So this is a patient out of state, so I'm not prescribing. So she's seeing a local LLMD and she was being treated for Lyme and Bartonella and her EBV antibodies kept going up mm. as, as her Lyme and co-infections got treated. Hmm. And so it's, you know, those things obviously toggle back and forth a bit too. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I think we have hit, let me just double check. I think. Yes, we've hit all the Q&A, we've hit the chat. Um, Dr. Seth, thank you so much. Your contribution is so valuable. And um, we will have, I am recording this, so we will have this recording available. It may take me a few days because I'm going out of town tomorrow for a few days. But um, if people want to listen back, we can. We will definitely make that available for you. Yeah. And just reach out if you have any questions. Um, if So the first step usually is to set up an SOT consult with Dr. Steph. Um, as she mentioned earlier, if you have a vibrant panel, so much the better, because then you've got you know clinical data plus lab data. Um, if you don't, no worries, we can order it for you. So don't feel like you have to have that lab work done to be able to come in and have an SOT consult. And Dr. Steph really is basically trying to correlate your symptoms, like either gather the lab data or look at the lab data and kind of put it together, put the pieces together, like where's the most sensible place to start. Um, And anyone that she consults with who is an active patient of mine, she and I will powwow. So we'll definitely get together and be like, okay, this person wants to do SOT. Okay, this is what I'm finding. This is what I'm seeing. And we'll kind of go back and forth. I do like even my patients, I like to have an SOT consult with her just because she dots all the I's and crosses all the T's. Like they may, you know, how long to be off antimicrobials, like she's micromanaging all that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so even if you're a patient of mine and want to do SOT, I still would have you do an SOT consult with Dr. Steph, cause she'll be able to track it all for you and get you lined up in the right direction. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions or want to set that up, just contact the office, um, info at restore medicine, restore And we will give you another update. Like we love sharing information. So Um, In another three to four months, we'll be back and we'll have more lab data and more patient reports and more information to share. So um, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here and and be able to have this webinar. And thank you again, Dr. Steph. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm so excited to be um, really getting going with the SOT now. It's been exciting. I know. It's very exciting. It's very cool. All right. So we'll see you all again very soon. Take care. Bye.